All righty, we're recording. Great. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the March 18th Community Council meeting of the Blue Horizons Project. I'm Keith Bamberger, who, and I'm the chair of the committee. So I'm here to run this meeting. And as we all get, by now we're mostly used to being in Zoom meetings, but um, I'd like the council members to keep your cameras on at least in the beginning of the meeting so people can associate your names and faces. Um, if you, and uh, everybody please mute yourself mute when yourself. you're not so speaking. The well, football four stage of the rocket is set up at NASA's Dennis Space Center in Mississippi. Oh, okay. During a previous test, speaking of which, that's not me. <laughs> shut down early. There we go. Um, so we've all been meeting for this is our fourth meeting, and so we're all getting to know each other. Um, but I just want to give an opportunity for everybody on the on the committee to uh, talk about anything related to the Blue Horizons project about. Um, uh, Anything interesting that's happened and work that you've been working on since the last meeting? I personally met with the MPO and had a good conversation about with them about transportation and the plants they have and how we can integrate those and help our goals of reducing carbon and being more energy efficient. And they were very excited about having this conversation and being a part of the committee um, also continue to talk to people about affordable housing. Um, but does anybody else have anything they'd like to share at this moment? That's a really good point. Metropolitan Planning Organization, they're actually housed at Land of Sky, but they, the MPO, um, coordinates the transportation for the road building and pedestrian infrastructure building. And it's a pretty complex process, but to sum it down into simple words, they take lists, they make lists of projects, they prioritize them both, and there are different sorts of lists, like there are pedestrian lists, there are highway lists, there are service road lists. Some of them have money and some of them don't. And this is part of getting builds roads built in urban areas. There's also a rural planning organization which works in the extra counties around, um, well, the non-urban counties. Thanks. I'll make a quick announcement. Uh, the Blue Ridge Electric Vehicle Club is working on our plans for Drive Electric Earth Day. We don't know exactly when in April it's going to happen, but um, and it won't be the full-blown in-person sort of thing we traditionally do, but keep an eye out and I'll keep this group apprised of what we're doing for Drive Electric Earth Day. Great, thank you. Any other thoughts from the community members or quick updates? Okay. So we will move into the agenda. And um, first part of every agenda is to approve the meetings from the February meeting or the minutes from the February meeting. Um, do you think we could do a round of introductions for all the council members first? Sure, why don't we go ahead and do that? All right. Great. Well, I'm Keith Bamberger, I'm the chair work for the Division of Air Quality, and I'm here to kind of facilitate and keep things moving. I'm, I'm Phelps Clark from uh, Sugar Hollow Solar. Dave? Uh, I'm Dave Erb. I'm a retired automotive engineer and college professor uh, with a specialty in electric vehicles. David? Uh, David King, uh, energy manager at uh, Western Carolina University. Got Brownie here. I, I'm Phelps Richard. Brownie, you're muted. We've got Eliza. Hey, everyone. I'm Eliza Stokes. I am an organizer and the communications manager at Mountain True. Um, 
I do not see Jason or Chris or Ken here. Oh, there you are, Ken. Yeah, uh, Ken Nelson, um, president of Blue Delta Energy. We work with a number of municipals and cooperatives around the country and are also doing a lot of work in renewable thermal technologies. Excellent. Um, and Sophie and Beatrice, if you could just introduce yourselves, you're important also. Thanks. Um, Sophie Mullinex, I'm the Blue Horizons Project project manager. Um, I did hear from Chris that he could not make it and I'm not sure about Jason, if anyone's heard from him. Thanks, I'm Beatrice. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with Blue Horizons. Great. All right, um, so why don't we move on to the meeting minutes and uh, I hope everybody got a chance to uh, look at the meeting minutes. Um, Go ahead and share them. Let's see. So you should be able to see the community or the minutes from the February meeting and uh, So do we have any discussion about these minutes? Yes, no, maybe. If we don't have any discussion, I need somebody to, um, to recommend that we approve these minutes. So moved. And seconded. All right, we've got a move and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. So we have eyes to approve the minutes. So we so we'll move on to the next agenda agenda item. And uh, of course, this is one of a couple of these things in this next group are about how we're going to work as a group. Um, we're still fairly new um, in working together and helping achieve the goals. And um, so let's just start talking about the memberships and working groups. How do we want to um, how would we like our working groups to move forward? We've got a whole group of them, which we talked about in the last meeting, and I could probably bring that up if you'd like me to. Um, but committees are certainly going to be a way that we get work done. Um, so which committees do we think are most important? And who among the board is willing to help facilitate those committees in moving forward? And if we can catch all this so we can actually um, start putting it into our working and our daily or our committee habits, that'd be great. This is where the committee talks. I'll jump, I'll jump in, Keith. Um, I, I'd like, I, I definitely think we need a transportation committee of some sort, a, a transportation effort of some sort. Um, and I am willing to lead that, but my, my natural bias is to have as few scheduled meetings as possible and have meetings when you need the specific meeting, something to happen personally. I think that is a good plan. Um, and of course, first thing we need to do is, is find the people to be partners in that group. And there's some obvious ones that I know of. I'm sure you all know of other people. And I think Eliza, didn't you express wanting to be in part of the, the transportation and transit that kind of moving people group earlier? Yeah, I think, um... 
both the transportation and community engagement ones would feel like good fits for me and I'd be happy to help facilitate either of those. Great. Hey, Keith, would you mind just bringing that list up just so we can all see it? Sure. Um, I think I closed it, but I'll open back up. Because it was captioned. So Sam Rarkistas can't be here today, but he wanted me to mention that he feels strongly there needs to be a working group around the 100% renewable energy plan by 2042, which is the overarching goal of this group. All right, so it should be right here in the middle of the working in the minutes from last, last uh, meeting. So I personally think that affordable housing and trying to get as one of the groups that's important, I, I'm willing to take to take some leadership there. Um, because personally, and, and as was noted last meeting, affordable housing and social justice are two different things. Um, but there's also a lot of overlap there, just like there is in transit and getting people moving along with the whole electric vehicles and that. So there's a little bit of crossover there. So um, so let me just... Sorry, I was looking at my notes. <laughs> um, so do we agree that affordable housing is something we should spend effort for and especially will that help us to achieve our goals? Is that, and I, something where Blue Horizons are got a good body of work working for towards getting energy efficiency and affordable homes and everything. Is that seem like a good direction to go? Yes, no, maybe. I'm wondering a little more about the purpose of that working group. Um, to Sophie's point about what Sam mentioned about there being a working group on the 100% renewable energy resolution. I feel like I'm kind of looking at each of these as smaller parts of us reaching our community goal. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I would, I would just ask, is that around renewable energy for affordable housing or, or is that sort of a broader goal that you're thinking there? So what, so what I see and why I see it's as important um, is that there's certainly, um, it's making sure that uh, energy efficiency is available to, uh, and, and a part of new affordable housing. And another component is trying to help, um, there's kind of a gap when it comes to when people are renting. So there's no incentive for somebody who is renting a unit to somebody to put any sort of energy efficiency in there because it ends up being the person who is renting who actually ends up playing the higher energy bills or whatever, or putting in even LED light bulbs and those sorts of things. So I, I just, I, to me, if we can get some, some ways for um, landlords to get incentives to put these into their rental units because so many people rent, but they don't really control their home's energy envelope, so to speak. That's kind of where I'm coming from. And if that's not a, if that doesn't need to be a group, that's also fine. I'm just, but that's what I see. That makes sense. We've of course already got the technology work group so, and they're doing great work. And of course, going back to the charter and making sure it makes sense consistent with that before we, and, and help uh, 
the Blue Horizons project move forward and move forward on that goal. Um, so the other question, of course, is how do we move forward? I mean, when do we wait for a need or do we want to start assembling partners or having conversations with people about how they can be involved in this um, now and moving into the future? Um, I think it'd be good to kind of, I don't know if you'd call it a best practices document or just a way to be aware and be ready when we have needs. So we're not, so the committee is ready if we need to start working on a project quickly. So Keith, I'll just kind of, I'll jump in just for a second and kind of to like what Dave and uh, Eliza uh, already mentioned, but uh, you know, it's kind of, I think, you know, looking at this list, trying to figure out where, where we all kind of, kind of lean into our strengths and, you know, what, what's, you know, kind of share Dave's kind of reservation with more meetings and uh, what I'm trying, you know, personally, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, with my just daily role, daily job, you know, how can I, what, what can I contribute to the group and what kind of makes the best sense to, to kind of fit and, you know, just personally, I'm looking at the tech group and, and I've got some very specific suggestions. So that I don't think merit a separate breakout group, but perhaps could be under the technology group. But again, the kind of day's reservations, you know, the fewer meetings, the better, you know, uh, I think there was a certain point you kind of lose some productivity and, you know, I've got about two hours a month to dedicate to, to you know, FaceTime to it. So, uh, right. I think, well, that, yeah, just try, we're trying to figure out where we all can kind of lean into our strengths and, and contribute and, and share the best best practices, you know, I'm just trying to. Right. Well, and that's, that's, I don't want to make meetings just for make, making no, meetings. No, no. But, and I totally appreciate that. Um, so, um, what I'm hearing is that we really want to have just, we want to be able to move quickly in whichever need we need to. Everybody's in kind of agreement with that. We don't need to start forming things beforehand, but perhaps making people around us aware that Blue Horizons is good putting thoughts in those directions. And, um, and of course, we don't need to have an official working group. I mean, the technology group is doing a great job of working and they've been working for a long time and technology keeps on adjusting, but we don't necessarily need that in most of these areas. Um, I am sure that in community outreach or community facing groups, one of the areas where I have strength and I'm certainly going to, when we start moving more, we're, I think that in a lot of ways, our community facing group may be a little bit on hold because of COVID, because a lot of things that we can do are out with people, but not necessarily. Um, and I, I think with the, you know, certainly on the technical side, it's some of the stuff we've done. It's like, it's pretty, it can be pretty dry. So we certainly looked at people like, uh, like yourself and Eliza to kind of make it interesting and more engaging and get it out there. So I could see that that'd be kind of a good, good um, uh, combining of talents. Um, I've got the Blue Horizons Project Charter up, or the Community Council Charter up, and just looking at that, you know, what's jumping out at me is that we're, the purpose of this group is to address the current climate crisis by supporting the community in achieving our goal of reducing energy demand and transitioning to 100% renewable energy by 2042 through collaboration with Buncombe County, the City of Asheville, and Duke Energy. So to me, that seems that we would need a 100% renewable energy group and a community engagement group, first and foremost. Um, just to, maybe we could just start with those two and maybe others will come to the surface. I, I hear definitely David and um, Dave's concern for a few more meetings, for sure. But just wanted to kind of bring back focus to the purpose of this group. Um, and as well as looking at these deliverables in here, most of them look like they could be worked on and accomplished with support or through those two working groups, 100% renewable clean energy um, and community engagement. Well, that, 
Thank you. I think that's a good place to start. Um, and we've got people who are interested in both. Um, do we want to spend set set up any expectations or goals, or just um, keeping in mind that we don't need to create meetings and everything? Um, what are some next steps that we want to try to take? And also, um, I guess where are places where we see the most need, I mean, to move quickly or not even quickly, but slowly in the right direction. Keith, let me jump in here um, for transportation. Why don't I, um, I will contact offline the people who've said they wanted to, to be involved in that. And if anybody who hasn't yet said that would like to be involved in that, let me know. Um, my plan at the moment would be to not have regular meetings, just, you know, we'll do things ad hoc. Um, but at, th at least that way we would be able to come back to next month's meeting with a group that can be a rapid response team, basically. And on the, the same kind of theme, um, I can certainly, um, I'll reach out to you, Eliza, offline, and we can start talking about what sort of thing that we want the community engagement group to look like, what, I mean, just um, sometime before the next meeting, just meet and talk and figure out where we want to go. Yeah? Great. That sounds good. I'm willing to be a part of or involved in the community engagement group for sure that would be part of my job as well so excellent and dave go ahead and loop me in on the transportation thing because that's where a lot of my efforts have been and experiences okay I'll, I'll put you on the list great Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is Phelps. Sorry, I turned my video off just because uh, uh, I got a busy uh, living room here. But I, uh, I want to try and jump in. I just need to figure out uh, where I think I can help, and so I'll uh, try and uh, be in touch. It's good. Great. Thanks. All right. Do we do? Uh... So as we did in the last meeting, after we talk about something, I do want to give the, the public a chance to comment on this briefly. If anybody in the public has something they would like to say, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But do we have any public comments about our work groups and how, how and what is most important? If, if I can uh, comment. Uh... I oversaw a, uh, a large village and we had a climate action plan and uh, the technical aspects were ni nicely addressed as is the case with what I'm hearing, particularly with the technical group that I'm part of. But first and foremost, uh, that became effective to get things done in the village was communication and holding everything from fairs, which unfortunately we can't yet, but it's coming, I think. Yep. The light is at the end of the tunnel. Uh, getting, a, getting constant information out there as to what the goal is and, and how it could be achieved uh, from individuals right up to institutional uh, achievements. And, uh, you know, the biggest drain on our energy is, is basically buildings, uh, and then comes transportation. That's what we found through the Climate Action Plan. Uh, but it was so important to get everyone to recognize they're very much a part of it just by replacing light bulbs. All they need is, is incentives and information, uh, incentives in the way of reduced prices for LEDs, and we have that here, as a matter of fact, through Duke. Uh, at least batteries and, uh, and bulbs has it for us nearby uh, here. And uh, uh, 
also you, you, you've got to make sure that people understand the ramifications of what they're doing. Why are they doing it? And uh, that reaches to health and, and basically uh, environmental benefits and put a value on it somehow, not only just the cost of electricity. I think that's going to be the, the most important thing to do because the, the big organizations are doing what they can, giving the message that's out there. Uh, but it's the smaller groupings and the individuals that are going to make a big dent. But it's constant communication, not just saying it once in a while. Fairs do a great job on that, and certainly the paper, uh, or in this case, uh, the internet. I still read the paper, a few of us do, right? <laughs> great, thank you, Peter. Any other comments? Brad? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I just uh, one comment is, is, you know, when we want to define what groups um, would that or what kind of groups we might want to have as working groups, I think we probably should look to seeing if the strategic planning process kind of from the top down where we map out a plan to achieve the goals of 100% renewable energy, um, then pops something up as far as, well, gee, this is a big nut we're going to have to crack in order to achieve that goal. We certainly need, um, you know, a committee or somebody thinking about that. So that part of the process is really to put a lot of focus on the strategic plan and then, and then work back from that. Um, my second note is that if there are opportunities that come up to move quickly, I would look to money becoming available that we identify that somehow needs a community wide response that we need to grab onto. And that money could easily be coming from Raleigh uh, through the stimulus package or from uh, Washington through climate legislation that might be coming along uh, or through the nonprofit sector, which I think is pretty, pretty active in, in that. And, um, you know, we just need to identify those opportunities and then jump on them and make sure that the fact that we have a Blue Horizons project, that we have a community council, that we're working together as a community as a whole, um, that that leads to us being able to get some money um, from that might become available so we can actually put things into action. Great, thank you, Brad. All right, I don't see any other hands up. So get back to my agenda. I, I have my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. Yeah. Ahead, um, so just to sort of double up on what Brad said and to reflect on what we just went through with the uh, Pratt and Whitney issue, um, we, I mean, we need the, strat the strat strategic process or whatever and plan, but we absolutely must come up with some sort of a, a very specific set of guidelines for businesses to understand the whole concept of how you achieve zero carbon by 2050, how to reduce that to realistic steps and how to reduce that and specifically, which is sort of gets back to communications. Specifically, we've got to get that into the uh, business development group here in town. Whoever it is who's inviting people, whoever it is who's supporting people, building businesses here, if we don't get that injected into the process, um, we're, we're not doing anything. Um, you know, we, and, it, and it's not a negative thing. And that's, that's the thing. And that's where our education comes in because this is stuff that will actually save money. I mean, yeah, just to catch everyone up over the last couple of months, repeatedly over and over, we've got more and more people writing and reporting on how the, including like the EU reporting on how the conversion to clean energy is actually going to grow the economy and save money. The, we're, it's a constant drain to the fossil industry. And, and, and by ending that, we have helped ourselves, all of us. So we need to get that into the business community because I honestly don't believe it's there. I know it's not there. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Bill? Yeah, I'd like to follow up on what Rick said. At the last minute, at the last uh, meeting, I, I mentioned like we need to contact a plant manager, for example, for Pratt & Whitney and for other companies coming into the area, get a hold of the CEO and so on. And I thought, well, rather than wait for somebody to do it, I'll just get a hold of Brownie. So I did, and Brownie, I can see is still on here. 
And if he's there, maybe he could comment. Uh, he, we went back and forth with email and I've got his comments right here. Uh, and if he's not available, I could read some of these. But Brownie, if you're there, would you like to talk a little bit about Pratt and Whitney and the plant manager that you got a hold of and what's going on with solar and so on, some of the things you mentioned? Maybe Perhaps we could save that there. for the, the partner updates. Okay. And this section let, me, of let me read to you something from what he wrote. Because I, you know, I'd mentioned this in a few meetings. I said, well, why don't I just go ahead and take care of it? So, Bill, okay? why don't we do this during the, this is part of the partner member update discussion. That's fine. So I, can, I, I can hold it off until later or whatever. Great. Thank you. But we do have some progress there. Excellent. All right. Um, so to move on to the next agenda item, additional members. And as we're moving forward, we're a group of nine. We've acknowledged in the previous meetings that that we would like to um, would like to bring more additional members onto the committee, um, and I just wanted to talk about that and figure out if we have if kind of develop a process that we're all comfortable with on how to accept new members, how to reach out to new members. There are some people out there, yeah, and we certainly have needs places where our our group is not as strong on all of our needs as set forth by the charter. So um, how do we want to do this? Do we want to have it be official or um, have them at some point either have one of us or myself invite them to join or do we want to have them go through the application process where they fill out an application then submit it to the board? Just uh, some kind of detail things on how we want to accept new members. Thoughts? Keith, I have a question. This is going to sound really ignorant, but how are we selected? I know we submitted a, a, an application, but who selected us? I figured it was magic. <laughs> Um, the, the former Energy Innovation Task Force put together a selection committee for the Blue Horizons Project Community Council, and people applied. We had about three weeks of open applications. Um, we also did some recruitment and then met as a selection committee to go through selections. I kind of figured that we, as the, as the current committee, would, would be the committee. The selection committee, or we would all review people who are who are considering be adding to the committee, even though that's kind of internal. But I think it's fine. If it's not fine, let me know because that's. I thought that we would make a good committee. It doesn't need to be all of us, but at least three or five of us. Once we have somebody who whose name is brought forward, again, that's a committee we don't need right now, but we will. I just want to remind the group that um, there are areas of representation also in the charter. And so some of those like affordable housing provider developer, we do not have filled. Um, and I think there was someone mentioned from the Dogwood Foundation last time. And I, I would just sort of ask that we look first at the areas of representation that we're missing before um, thinking about other big focus areas that we haven't already talked about. Thank you. So do we have any, so at the moment, um, we still don't have a way to do that. And I am fine until somebody who makes sense to the committee comes forward and then we can discuss it then. I don't think we have to formalize it, but it's just something that's, uh, well, we've talked about it at the other meetings. Um, if that's where you want to leave it, I'm good with that. And we can move on to the next um, agenda item. Yes, no? All right, I'm getting nods, that's good. Can we All circle right. back first on, um, I know there was a candidate who would represent affordable housing Right. who came to our last meeting. Can, can you update us on what happened? So I talked to Andrew um, and he is interested in being involved in affordable housing. If we have a committee, he's 
interesting in being a part of that. He does not feel he has the time to contribute as a full serving member, but he's certainly interested in what we're doing. So okay. I spoke with him. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So on to the next item is the vice chair. Um, we don't have one. Right now I'm healthy, but we never know. <laughs> I do play hockey. So my plan, if I can't make a meeting, is to let Sophie know and then start calling you. So I'm probably going to do it alphabetically. So Dave, it may be you. Keith, we did. I, I, at least I think we had, had the idea of making that a rotating or revolving role so we could all kind of get that experience. So, okay. But I, I don't know how much planning that takes ahead of time that what, between yourself, Sophie, and, and whatnot. Maybe so I can tell you what I do yeah. to plan the meeting, if sure. that'll help. So Sophie and I, I called her, um, sent out a message last week to get agenda items, which I would still be able to do if I'm not in the meeting. I talked to her for about an hour on Tuesday just to figure out what's going on in the agenda and make sure everything was in the right place. And then I, well, I talked to her again later in the week. But um, so it's really not that much. It's just, um, really just taking the meeting and guiding you through the meeting, um, making sure everybody's heard. Um, uh, well, I mean, what do the two of you guys think if you had a, a vice chair, or like the revolving roles, so that if you have one person per meeting that kind of is in that meet, that you know, planning meeting, and if you can't attend, they're, they're up to speed. I mean, what do you guys think of that? Are you asking Keith and myself? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I, someone from Blue Horizons Project will always play this administrative role of running the meeting or helping run the meeting, setting up the Zoom, maintaining the website, sending out notifications and communication about meetings and materials. But um, I think Keith is right that there, there does need to be like sort of a backup. And it's a traditional structure to have a vice chair when in sort of in groups like this, in my experience. Um, but if there's no one, who wants to step up, I guess, I don't know, I'll leave that to the group to, to talk about. And if Keith one day <laughs> isn't stuck in a snowstorm or something or sick, then um, that'll just be a rocky thing that happens, I suppose. Uh, I, I'm tempted to say I'll, I'll do it. I feel like I know, I feel like see, maybe we're all busy. I feel busy, but I, and I don't feel like I have the experience, but I can, I, I'm happy to maybe try and help out. Uh, I know I've been, I know I always think I'm going to have more time than I do, uh, but uh, I'm happy to help out if you guys need me. So how about this Phelps? Um, next month or if we have, right now we've been having monthly meetings. When I have that initial conversation with Sophie, I'll, I'll invite you to that conversation so you can just get a feel of it yeah that's that's great that's great all right um hey this is uh this is brownie i think we should i think we should select someone to be in this role and uh, i think phelps would be would be great for it so phelps if you're willing to do it i think i think we should just have someone it is one of those jobs where uh you know typically there's not a lot to do you know um but but every now and then, you know, we all have things that come up if you're in, you know, unexpectedly and you can't be at a meeting or not feeling good or something like that. So I don't think it will take a lot of time, but it's just one of those things of having someone who's who's kind of ready to, to step in in the, you know, fairly, you know, fairly um, infrequent circumstances when the chair can't uh, do it for whatever reason. So um Anyway, I appreciate your willingness to do it. I think you'd be great for it. Okay, cool. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to I'm happy to do it. Great. Thank you, Phelps. So um, next agenda item, a retreat. And um, it's got a question mark behind it. Um, 
I feel like this has been a very strange way to start a committee where we see each other in little boxes instead of actually in person. But, um, and we may potentially have new additional um, committee members come on. Um, but it's just something that I wanna put out there that at some point um, when we can meet in person, it might be good to have a longer session between the board members um, and just something to think about. Uh, I, I do think that, um, that waiting if we're going to have more committee members, and it should be wait till they're on board, of course. So something to think about in the future and what sort of format we'd like. Um, I just, if anybody would like to discuss it, that's fine, or I can just leave it there. All right, good. So I'll think about some, um, well, I'll think about that more and just keep it in my mind as something we'd like to do in the future. All right. Um, so we already had public comment to say, but does anybody from the public have another thing they'd like to comment on before we move on to the barriers and opportunities discussion? Um, this this is Rick. You, you know, one of the things you don't have, one of the, the representations you don't have on the on the council, is um, representation from the HVAC industry. And HVAC is, you know, the number one consumer of energy, and big giant key to zero. It, it the representation is important. Uh, unfortunately, people like me, I, I I honestly don't have time. I'm really struggling to try to keep up with everything we're trying to do because we're doing a bunch of uh, innovation work, grant work. And so, but if you considered it a little less formal and you consider that the committee isn't just an exclusive group and that maybe the committee drags in other people from time to time on specific topics, you know, for a sort of that specialty point of view, yet it just might facilitate that a little better. Just saying. I mean, there's just this, there's just this sort of governmental, not a complaint, just an observation. This kind of Robert's Rules of Order kind of mentality that happens. And I got to be honest with you. I don't know. Maybe I've just been in Nashville too long, but I personally find that to be a weakness uh, to some degree. It works for public meetings when you got you got really unruly crowds and stuff, but maybe it's not totally the way to look at things. Great, thanks for Rick. And I do like that idea of when we need expertise, reaching out to people to provide it for the meeting, kind of doing a program. I think that's a great way to move forward. Um, and it's something we're open towards. And Beatrice, your cat's distracting me. <laughs> Not in a bad way. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's move on to the barriers and opportunities discussion. Um, got a considerable amount of the so I'm going to bring it up and share my share it on the screen so we all sent in different um, barriers and opportunities um, a lot of different ones um, some of them are echoed, some of them are similar. Uh, I do think that in a lot of ways, this has some echoes into our charter um, with some of the, um, some of the things we're trying to accomplish and also some of the ways we might accomplish it. Um, do we have any discussion over this, this I think this meeting will probably be a really good meeting to discuss this because it's kind of, well, it doesn't have as many things on the agenda as the last few. But just any thoughts? Hey, Keith, if you, if you can scroll down to that second page. Okay. I don't feel like people can really read this maybe somebody could give like a highlights just to make it a little more accessible for folks okay 
So I'll just go through it and uh, get read them as they're set out. So decarbonizing buildings, 24 seven renewable energy, electric transportation incentives, wastewater and building blue delta that, energy. Yeah, that was when I thought this was more in, for internal discussion purposes, but yeah, okay. I mean, that, that was mine. And, and, and the biggest thing, I think this is dovetailing to some extent into where maybe our working groups could be formulated if, if we're, our goal here is to come up with various, you know, to, to be an advocacy and educational body of, of uh, experts, I guess, in working in these various segments to help advise the discussion uh, on these topics, maybe we align ourselves like having a HVAC and building working group that prepares, or of course, could be that resource for that's any, any stakeholder groups that we're looking for input from building decarbonization. We have a transportation working group that is looking at ways of decarbonizing transportation and, and an equity and justice a group that's focused on how do we be inclusive in terms of what we're trying to do. But, but really at the end of the day, those groups are like geared towards being that community resource that can engage with the business community or the public or whomever, but can prepare maybe more or less policy or, or, or be like a little mini think tank, I guess, in those specific areas and can be a resource to whomever, whether it's the business community, the government, uh, public sector, the public itself. That's kind of where I'm maybe thinking um, how we might organize our efforts. So to kind of re rephrase what I think you said, we should use these um, concerns and opportunities to kind of fuel our committees and groups and our action going forward. So kind of, uh, and use it to, to, to feed our work kind of. Is, is that reason? I mean, I don't know. I'm interested to hear what others have to say about that, but. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with Ken. And, and, um, if, if you want to keep going now, Keith, I can kind of add some detail to, to what I had added. So I do do like that. I also like the idea of keeping this as kind of an open document, you know, as we as we both hone in and focus on what we do. And as technology happens, as things happen, as we continue to add to this document and adjust um, kind of in the background to kind of a place to put things. And we all have access to this document. Um, at least I do, so I assume that everybody does. Because, uh, um, and a fifth one too, maybe even along the lines of how do we build a renewable industry within the city? How, how do we incentivize, you know, Asheville, you know, is a climate city and we're, we have some resources here that are very focused on climate, but is just from a development standpoint, can we uh, maybe even have a working group that, or, or a mission, and maybe not a working group, maybe I'm putting too many working groups out there, but at least as a mission, how do we incentivize more business and uh, that are in this sector to relocate or to focus on Asheville? Yeah, yeah that makes great sense. Um, and it kind of goes back to what um, somebody said earlier about, you know, becoming more involved in the business aspect of Asheville. Um, which of course, um, it's a big part of how things happen and how we're gonna meet our goals. I think that's great. So, um, I'll just move this down. So um, I think that really rather thinking about this as as more of a, so this is kind of filling in those gaps or filling in the potential of our work groups or not necessarily work groups of our mission and especially the, um, the larger mission of right now we've got 
uh, transportation, and then the 100% renewable energy group. We can use these uh, to fuel those and try to figure out how they sink in and work forward. If that makes sense. I can, there are more pages, but. Uh, So Keith, if you can scroll back to the second page, I, I think page two. Yeah, just, just so what I what I'd kind of some deliverables I'd kind of propose to the group, and everybody kind of you know nodded. And, and I don't know if it needs to be a necessarily a working group because it kind of overlaps with just my just daily daily job. But um, to Ken's point, it's it's kind of like what are, what can each of us be a resource on? So. Um, that's, uh, you know, some of the specifics I laid out there, whether that, that some of those may fit within the tech group or, or would that be a working group of demand side management, which, which is commercial HVAC, but it's, you know, so that, that's kind of what I'm struggling with. You know, how do we, how can we just kind of be, you know, uh, all share our resources you know, and without creating a lot of extra uh, unnecessary work. So anyway, I don't have any conclusions for you, but, uh, and I do think that has a lot of crossover with um, the communications group. I mean, mm -hmm. is they're not, I mean, because they are all inherently connected because we all have one big goal, but how can we as a community, once we have a resource or have a group of people to work on, how can we as the council let the community know where we can help them? Yeah, um, I agree with that. And I'm certainly not looking for complete answers in this at this point. We're still having a discussion. And I think in a lot of ways, we're still figuring out how we're going to be most effective as a committee. And that's fine. We've been meeting together from a distance for several months. And um, that's OK. I mean, I certainly, when I put my stuff in, um, I was just looking at the areas where I think that we can have the best, and this is basically based on my skill set and where we can have the best potential. I mean, transportation is certainly, and I don't really think of things as transportations and obstacles, but just opportunities because that's how my mind works. Um, I do still have fear of the North Carolina Department of Transportation's long range transportation plan, um, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, so do we have any more discussion on this or, or um, how we wanna use this? I mean, I think using it as an open document to help us focus our energies or on just a place to put ideas might be a good way to move forward. Um, and it certainly can be categorized and, and adjusted. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Any other thoughts? All right, so now we're to the partner and member updates and discussion. First is the tech committee and I guess, Sophie, you're gonna present for John. Yes, he told me he could not join the meeting today, but he did send me a brief update. No specific updates to share, um, but at the March meeting of the Tech Committee, we reviewed the status of the cold climate heat pump pilot that the Tech Committee has been working on for going on three years now. Um, and I'm happy to send out a summary of this. I think I may have before, um, but it's in partnership with Duke Energy and Advanced Energy. And it is uh, trying to be a proof of concept for um, cold, cold climate heat pumps, variable speed heat pumps, um, well, heat pumps that are more suited to the colder winters that we have here. Um, and it's really exciting to dig into the data um, through advanced energy. They're monitoring about 
seven homes here in Asheville and with different types of heat pumps and comparing um, the different energy use of those heat pumps. So if you're into that kind of thing, it's, it's really cool. Um, but we're hoping that it'll help spur on the creation of more incentives from Duke Energy for electric air source heat pumps, especially variable speed and higher efficiency ones. Um, and this year we intend to engage in similar efforts to pilot and study emerging technologies and customer solutions in support of community renewable energy goals. So that's that from John. Thank you. And then from the Energy Savers Network. Hey everyone, I'm Hannah Egan, the Outreach and Resource Coordinator for Energy Savers Network um, with an update on our program. Um, we just hired a new operations coordinator, Steffi Rausch. Um, so she'll be starting with us next week. So we're excited to work with her. Um, and to date, since July 1st, we've served exactly 100 homes. Um, this most recent quarter that we're finishing up right now has been our most successful one yet. Um, we've been able to client recruit and keep our schedule full, um, especially in the Emma neighborhood in West Asheville. Um, we're also going to be working with Homeward Bound on their new project with the Days In on Tunnel Road. Um, they're still fin like finalizing everything um, with purchasing that property. Um, so it's going to be a while out, but we're going to help them do some weatherization upgrades there. Um, mostly LEDs, um, low flow water fixtures like aerators and shower heads. Um, but yeah, so that'll be down the road. Um, we are also working with the housing authority, um, specifically with the Hillcrest and Klondike apartments um, to do some energy upgrades there as well. Um, we're still working on the contract, but we're hoping to get started around mid-May. Um, and in that case, the city has actually done a pretty good job with um, providing LED bulbs and low flow um, toilets. So we'll be doing low, other low, low water fixtures like aerators and shower heads there, um, and then doing water heater um, pipe installation, um, weather stripping, and then any other small upgrades as we see fit. Um, but yeah, that's all I have for Energy Savers Network, unless anyone has any questions. Any questions? That's, uh, this is Brownie. Hey, that's great news. Um, and I guess just uh, a high level question with, you know, COVID, you know, limitations earlier, especially earlier this year, but still, still, of course, relevant. Mm -hmm. With things picking up, as you just described, what's kind of the overall outlook for like goals for the year and things like that in light of how COVID has affected? Uh, yeah, COVID has been a huge work. factor for us this yeah. year. Um, it was really tough when we first started back in the summer. Um, we had limited resources, especially with our volunteers. We rely heavily on volunteers and we just didn't have that support. Um, we are hoping to... We, um, as our volunteers are getting vaccinated and feel more comfortable coming out in the field with us, um, I think we're going to be a lot more successful in reaching our goals. Um, like I said, this quarter, we are the closest to hitting our goal, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to get it by the end of the month. Um, but I'm pretty confident that the final quarter, um, we'll be able to hit our 50 um, homes for three months. But yeah, it was, it's been really, really tough for us. Um, with client exposures and having cancellations, even our crew being exposed and having to cancel. Um, so yeah, COVID really uh, has affected our numbers this year a lot. And we've been in regular touch at least monthly with the city and the county, um, Jeremiah and Bridget um, and Kira, um, helping them understand like where we're, where we're at and um, the way that COVID has been affecting the number of homes that we've been able to weatherize. But I'm, Thanks. yeah, I'm personally really proud of the Energy Savers Network team being able to pivot and, and stay positive throughout everything. It's been 
really, really tough to adapt. And we've been working with new subcontractors in this fiscal year, which has been an adjustment as well. And um, I think it's, it's going as well as we can, as well as it could, given the circumstances. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. Great, thank you. And yeah, we're really excited you're doing well, despite all those difficulties. All right, the Greenbelt Alliance, and that's you again, Sophie. I'm standing in for a lot of folks today who can't be here. Um, so a staffing update is that Hannah mentioned that we've hired a new operations coordinator to replace Yulia Schaefer, who's going to be moving on to a PhD program, we believe. Um, so we'll miss her very much, but Steffi Rausch has been involved with Energy Savers Network in a volunteer capacity for a very long time has been involved in clean energy efforts in town for a very long time as well, for lack of a, a better term, but we're excited to bring on Steffi. I think she officially starts this coming Monday. Um, and as far as the 100% renewable energy strategic plan, I believe the update is that we have secured some funding from Candida as well, and we'll be partnering with um, South Face to develop a strategic plan for the 100% renewable energy for our community by 2042 roadmap. Um, Brad Rouse and Sam and I and Beatrice are meeting to have an initial planning discussion next week on this. Um, sorry, back to staffing. Uh, we're still hiring for a Greenbelt Homes program manager. So someone with um, energy rating skills is what we're looking for to replace our longtime Greenbelt Homes manager, Maggie Leslie, uh, who's been in that role for almost 20 years now, since the very early days of Greenbelt Alliance. Um, so just spread the word and uh, hopefully we'll get someone on that in that role really soon. Great, thank you. And this is you again, Sophie, Blue Horizons Project Residential and Commercial EE. Um, I actually see Solarize, Asheville oh. Buncombe first. And Sorry. If, that's okay. If I see Ken has joined from Solar Crowdsource, if you'd like to take this, Ken, please do. Sure, happy to give you some relief there, Sophie. No worries. Um, great to be with everyone this afternoon. Sorry, I couldn't be on earlier, but quick update from the Solarize side. Sophie's done a great job over the past several meetings describing the effort and uh, taking you through kind of where we are. But to bring you up to date since the last meeting, the uh, work of subcommittees continues in earnest and as well as a steering committee overall uh, that, that get uh, information rolled up from the subcommittee. So we have three that are operating right now, all of very active and very engaged participants, which is uh, outstanding. One is the low and moderate income uh, effort, which is the program that will be uh, dovetailed with the overall Solarize program to ensure that we're serving more than just people who uh, can afford it with the tiers that we're going to be creating. And um, that's an exciting program. There's a lot of proactive effort to identify how that qualifying will work, as well as to make sure we're prepared to deliver on any early opportunities to serve uh, identified participants in that. So that's been running well, really well. In addition, we've got a, uh, a subcommittee that's focused on workforce development and a really exciting uh, component since last we reported is a relationship with green opportunities. Uh, we're uh, really pleased to be involved with Ben Williamson and uh, the organization now in a way that I think will take the workforce development piece and help it uh, get shaped in the early going uh, with the uh, program that's going to occur through the campaign this year, but also be a long lasting workforce development sort of onboard uh, program. So that's been uh, very, very fulfilling and will continue to evolve as we move forward. And then finally, and importantly, there's been a subcommittee focused on evaluating uh, uh, the installer uh, bids and to make a selection and make a recommendation. We're in the latter throes of that. We're very close to the finish line. In fact, uh, just to let you know, probably early next week, we should be in a position uh, to announce uh, the installer or installers that are gonna be involved in helping us execute on this. So 
That's an important milestone, which will lead to a launch, a public launch somewhere in the early April period. We could be on a couple of dates that are being determined right now, April 5th or 6th, but you'll hear more about that. And finally, I wanna, uh, in connection with that launch, uh, invite everybody to it. You'll get uh, notice of it, of course, but beyond that, once the major launches uh, occurred, we wanna ask everyone to invite us to uh, present to your organization, if you have one, or to your subgroup or to your neighbor group, association, homeowners, uh, any other organization or Zoom uh, gathering that would have us talk a little bit about Solar Eyes, we're happy to do so. It could be a long form presentation, or it could be just a quick few minutes on an agenda. Or if you don't want us at all, we, we will prepare and give you a few key points about the program that you could share with people you know. The main thing that we want to do is use April and May to get the word out and spread the word in the community about the opportunity to, to, uh, to be involved in it and to take a look at it. So that's it, Sophie, I'll hand it back to you in case you wanna fill in any other blanks. No, it's great. We've reached this pivotal milestone, I feel like, and things are gonna start gelling and solidifying more um, in a campaign that has been really exciting so far, but also um, kind of nebulous in some ways. Like we were waiting for things to kind of fall in place and we're doing a lot of groundwork to make that happen, but um, we're really excited to have a launch in early April and um, get the community jazzed about it. We've had 71 people already sign up um, to express their interest in getting a free assessment. I'm one of them, maybe you should be too, just saying. Well, that's great. Um, and now the communications work group has something to do. Right. Um, all right, so to move now on to the Blue Horizons Project Residential and Commercial EE. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, before I move on to that, I know Ben Williamson is on the call. I didn't know if he wanted to say something or show his face, but up to you, Ben. Um, we're really, really excited about the partnership and the energy and strategic thinking and experience that you bring to the campaign. Cannot, it's impossible to overexpress that, I think, at least from my end. But if you wanna say hello, please do. Oh, thank you for those incredibly kind words and hello to everybody uh, on the on this call. I was excited to be invited today and uh, listen and, and learn more about the awesome work that, that you've been involved with. And I, I don't think I have much to add. Ken's description uh, about our involvement was, was awesome. And uh, we are excited about this particular Solarize campaigns um, uh, initiatives around inclusion of workforce development, specifically around uh, including uh, marginalized communities and those uh, with traditional obstacles to employment. Uh, we do see uh, a myriad of opportunities there and have begun conversations with um, the bid providers around what workforce development could look like for uh, long-term employment with the green economy and specifically solar installation. Uh, but also with our local providers as well, and uh, looking to, um, uh, again, to forge some relationships that will extend beyond the scope of the campaign. Um, so we're, we're thrilled uh, to be a part of that. It's, uh, it's a big part of our new direction here at GO. Uh, certainly happy to have further discussions offline with anyone else that might be interested in learning more about that. Uh, otherwise, just thank you for uh, being invited and uh, excited to, to work with everyone. Thanks. Awesome, thanks. Now I'm happy to dive into Blue Horizons project programmatic updates. Um, so on the residential side, uh, for those of you who saw our latest newsletter, we have launched a mini program called Energy Chats, um, and that is a virtual energy advising um, session that we can have one on one with anyone in Buncombe County who's a resident and has questions about energy. So we've had done two of these so far. I think they've gone really well. Um, Beatrice and I are tag teaming them along with some support from Kelvin Bonilla, um, who has a really excellent building science background. And so we've been answering questions about like, how do I prioritize different upgrades to my home? Like in the um, energy efficiency pyramid of uh, prioritization, you know? So we talk about the basics like lighting and air sealing and weatherization. 
Um, some folks, or the two folks that we've talked to just recently bought new homes, which is very exciting for them. And so both of them are interested in going solar, but we were able to talk to them too about the things you should do in your home to reduce your energy use first. Um, got into the nitty gritty of some mini split heat pumps um, where you know, I had to brush up a little bit on my knowledge of them because I don't have direct experience with them. Um, and just sent, basically we do follow up um, to ensure that these folks have resources and connections to um, the right people or contractors or organizations in our community who can help them further their clean energy goals at their homes. Um, so we're really excited about this. And it's something that we've done sort of ad hoc, but we wanted to formalize it, especially uh, since we're not really able to meet in person with everybody right now. Sorry, there's a siren. Hopefully that wasn't too loud. Um, and I wanna thank Beatrice too for really helping push and formalize this program and um, her efforts around all the communication around it. So anything that you might see on our social media or anything that's jazzed up in our newsletter has been definitely Beatrice and um, she's been rocking and rolling in her new role. Um, let's see, for commercial, we are engaging with South Face Institute um, and it's been a slow process, uh, primarily due to COVID, um, but we are right now working with them to review property data from Buncombe County. We've put in a, or we received a data dump from the property records or tax office at Buncombe County, and they are helping us sort through it um, and prioritize different leads. Uh, so it's been really fascinating to see 128,000 records, you know, filtered into different priority types. Um, if you're at all into that sort of data, it's it's been pretty fascinating, but building four tiers of priority leads and uh, are also building on planning an outreach strategy uh, to be able to engage these entities in Buncombe County um, on energy efficiency and renewable energy. And we're definitely going to be promoting our Solarize campaign to these entities as well, because the Solarize campaign is not just for residents, although we anticipate it will be primarily residential, we hope to get some businesses in there participating as well, because it's gonna be a great opportunity. Hey, so that, that uh, data from, from South Face, is that, is that mostly just square footage of buildings or what's? Um, it is not just square footage of buildings, it's building types, um, different categories of, of businesses within Buncombe County, uh, specific areas of the county. Uh, let's see, there's, those, those are the main actual categories we're looking at. So we're trying to filter it by, you know, which entities own multiple properties, own and manage multiple properties, which are over, you know, a certain square footage, um, who's paying the bills on these properties too. Like one of the largest property owners in Buncombe County is Buncombe County itself. Um, and we all know that they have their own energy management um, efforts. So. That's a, that's a, that's a really valuable data, data set, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's Where? public information. It's just a matter mm -hmm. of taking the time and sorting through it and figuring out what these land use categories mean because you need a legend to figure it out because it's just numbers or letters mm. so uh, it's been been slow but also anybody could do this <laughs> kind of on a similar note you just made me think of something do you do you have access to like a, a list of county or city lead buildings like lead gold lead silver i don't but i bet that you know jeremiah Leroy with the county might have access yeah. to that or know where to find that yeah just just curious so is there any sort of a transportation infrastructure layer in that data set or would it be possible not from what you got oh i'm not sure what are you asking so well in my one of my discussions um with somebody recently we were to look 
when it comes to land use planning and transportation and transit and all, it's all so integrated from that side. And um, so I, and that's really where a good part of our future comes from is where they build things and where things, and I didn't know if that was part of the data set, but it's really, um, it appeals to the data geek in me. No, I mean, I think you could overlay this with the right tool. Um, yeah. It does have addresses. You could overlay it with public transportation <clears throat> maps. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you for that report. It's You're exciting. And I want to get back to what you're speaking what you were speaking about earlier, Bill, um, with Pratt Whitney, and um, why don't you go ahead and make your report now? Thanks a lot, Keith. Brownie, if you're there, uh, we were corresponding, and, and since the last meeting, Brownie had a chance to reach out to the plant manager and talk about solar potential and had a meeting and talked to him about getting someone that's involved with very large commercial projects to do something in the way of estimating what would be involved with electrical usage and solar and kind of an annual plan and look at peak base, you know, peaks and so forth. It was also going to get uh, someone that we might be able to talk to for the tech committee. So Brownie, are you there? If you would, would you go ahead and, and tell us about what you found on all this? Thank you. Sure, sure Bill, I'd be happy to. Yeah, as Bill said, um, since I think it's since our most recent meeting or, or there, um, you know, I have requ I'd requested a meeting with the person who's becoming plant manager for the new facility. Um, he's currently a plant manager at one of Pratt's manufacturing facilities, I think in the <clears throat> Philadelphia area or somewhere else in Pennsylvania. Anyway, but he's been assigned to be, <clears throat> he'll be the plant manager for the new manufacturing facility. So he's now, you know, fully working on the planning around that. So um, I basically arranged a meeting with him to pitch them on the idea that they should consider some type of significant renewable energy um, systems for the new manufacturing facility, because it's gonna be a huge consumer of electricity and have large demands. And, um, you know, so I kind of, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how much, um, how much they might know about the technology and how things are going with it. You know, some basic research around the company. Um, you can see that they've done, you know, when you, if you look at their sustainability pages and things like that, they've done a few projects um, at other um, facilities that they operate, but I couldn't find anything um, indicating they had done any really large scale projects. Everything that I saw based on what the company points to in their sustainability and clean energy uh, documents are pretty small systems, kind of pilot project type installations is how they appear to me. So, um, so I basically uh, did an overview about what's happening with the solar in industry, um, you know, nationally, but specifically in North Carolina as well, and how North, North Carolina has in many ways been one of the real uh, success stories in terms of solar energy growth um, over the last decade and in the last five years in particular, how we've been, you know, outside of California, more solar has been deployed in North Carolina than, than anywhere else in the nation. And um, talked about how the changes in the cost of the technology and just the significant reductions in technology costs have just rapidly changed this from, <clears throat> you know, a relatively small niche in the en en energy industry to along with wind, you know, the fastest growing new source of power generation in the country and has fallen in, in price so much that it's actually, you know, whereas it used to require different kinds of subsidies and price premiums in North Carolina, you know, solar has become so cheap in North Carolina that through the competitive procurement process, the state has now, <clears throat> it's actually lowered the overall avoided energy rates in the state because it's cheaper than the other mix of energy um, that feeds into the overall avoided cost rates that we uh, we have in North Carolina. So anyway, I just kind of you know pitched them on the idea that you don't need to think about this just as something to do to kind of check an environmental box or score some public relations benefits, you know, in our 
uh, environmentally minded community that you're coming into, not that you won't do that if you do a great project, but that, you know, I really encourage them to think about uh, doing something um, larger scale to address a meaningful percentage of their electrical uh, needs at the, at the new manufacturing facility and to look at it from um, uh, as a business opportunity and a financial opportunity to manage and lower their utility costs, as well as to do a potentially really significant um, clean energy project. So um, they, and I basically said, you know, what I would encourage them to do is that I would be willing to work with them to connect them with some of the um, leaders in the solar industry in the state who have experience doing really large scale projects to basically create a proposal for their facility to give them something specifically to react to, you know, instead of just kind of thinking about this as a concept to prepare a specific proposal. To do that, we need information on what their expected annual electrical usage is. We need information on what their expected peak um, power requirements are going to be. You know, this is going to be a million square foot um, advanced manufacturing facilities, um, <clears throat> you know, so a huge new roof platform. So we will need some information about their roof materials um, that will be utilized and um, some just of the engineering information around that. But I also think there could be opportunities to look at, and they actually brought this up on the phone, I mean, on the, on the, <clears throat> on the Zoom call that, you know, they indicated they're open to looking at the roof, uh, utilization of the roof space, but they would also like to look at the, the, uh, the other parts of the site so there's going to be, you know, there's going to be 800 people working there. There's a big parking lot. So they said that they would like to look at potential ground mounted installations on the property, um, as well as being open to utilization of the roof space. And I think that that's great because I think, uh, I think there could be interesting opportunities in both of those types of locations. So they agreed to send us information on the roofing materials, the roof engineering, um, as well as a more detailed site plan. Um, so that that could be looked at. Um, and I've asked one of the solar companies in the state who, again, has got experience in this to, you know, take all this information and put together a specific proposal uh, for, that could, for, for that facility so that the company would have something specific to react to if they like the ideas that come out of that, or at least find them interesting, then, of course, at that point, they could take a deeper dive in terms of exploring that proposal in greater detail, or they could um, issue a request for proposals like the county went through recently where they kind of invite, you know, anybody to put a proposal forward. But I think it will be very helpful for them to have some specific proposal to react to to get a more, some more clear ideas about what exactly might be possible there and what, what at least one credible company um, would be indicating the economics of it could look like to then decide what process to take from there. Hopefully, I mean, and they, you know, they, they, there's no guarantee they'll decide to take it further than that, but they did, they did um, agree to, you know, to take, a, to take a real look at this, which was what I was hoping they would agree to do uh, in that meeting. So they're in the process of compiling that information they, they said that they would like to have it done in a few weeks. It's been longer than that now. I have pestered them several times since then, and they, they say that they are still working on it. There's a few different things that they're changing that, that they want to get the data on. I believe that they really are working on it. So anyway, that's kind of the, um, the update on where things stand in that conversation. The other thing I asked is that I said, you know, this meeting that I've asked for is kind of focused on solar opportunities, and that's kind of where I have more of my background. But um, I said there's a lot of community interest in the fact that you're, you know, you're looking at energy efficiency opportunities for your facility too. So um, I, 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 one of the other asks is that they um, basically um, provide someone for folks to talk to around all the other energy opportunities as well, around efficiency and things like that. So I'm hoping that in the near future, they'll kind of have someone who will be a designated liaison to communicate about the non-solar, you know, uh, clean energy opportunities in addition to that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for contacting and for all that you did. Thank you very much.
This is great. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do it. I mean, as everyone knows, it's a it's a it's a big project. It's going to be a big energy consumer. So, but it also means it's a big opportunity to do some to do some good things. Um, there's no guarantee at the stage like this how it will turn out. But um, you know, engaging is what we want to be doing right now. So we'll see how it uh, we'll see how it progresses. And I'm happy to keep everyone posted. And again, hopefully, kind of create some space for it for a kind of a parallel conversation around around. Um, the building envelope and all these other aspects of what could be possible there. Mm -hmm. This will be a model because others others will be following soon, I'm sure, at some time, sure. Back to you, Keith, I think. Uh, Brownie, if you're done, Keith. Yeah. Great, thanks. That's, that was really good work. Um, really a lot of potential hope there. Um, so we are to, is there any other additional business for the, Council? Right. Any additional public comment? Go ahead, Rick. No, oh, I'm sorry, Peter. I, no, go ahead, Rick. I, I think you were going to say something I was going to say, but go ahead. Well, this is, no, no, actually not. This segues really interestingly after what Brownie just said, because Brownie put before them a solid proposal is going to put before them a solid proposal. And so one of the things that Judy and I are working on with a nationwide team is we have an ARPA, ARPA, you know, the Advanced Research Projects Agency is kind of, for engineering work, it's kind of the top level grant what the government does. They'll, they'll pick like some number of real front edge things and fund them. And they have an open cycle, which they do only once every three years, it's open right now with um, concept papers due in just a couple of weeks. And we're going to put one in on basically what you've heard us talk about a lot. But um, with a couple of twists, we actually, actually have an innovation set that's in, related to this, having to do a very high temperature heat pump. So going after industry, uh, hot water thermal storage and stuff like this for grid balancing and everything. So sort of a techie thing. But as part of it, we believe that this whole thing mm -hmm. of getting building thermal advancement going in this country at the pace that's needed uh, to achieve real climate action actually requires maybe some technological um, push. And so one of the aspects of this that we've been actually proposing now for four years, starting with a thing we won at MIT years ago, um, is a set of tools that lay people and or activists can go and just from the outside of buildings, they can go and take pictures of buildings and enter some data about the buildings and the usage and basically create what Brownie just said, a model proposal to building owners and whatnot. And in a way that the building owners can consider whether this is interesting to pursue forward. And then you can also just boom, put it up on the public list to request some initial contractor interest, you know, from like design build contractors. This is all about getting around the engineers who, at least from what we've experienced, are sort of standing in the way a lot of this building's advancement. Either the engineers know this stuff and they do it, or they don't know about it or don't want to learn about it and they block it. So this is about getting through that barrier, getting through that barrier of knowledge and doing so in a way that allows activists and lay people to start driving some of this change. So it's very interesting to me. It's exactly what Ronnie just said, at least in my mind. Um, and so what I, I bring this up here, I just to share it, but also because this is just a concept paper and who the heck knows if they'd be interested, you don't know. But the same proposal uh, we're throwing before the House Select Committee on climate action, climate uh, crisis, and before any grant, any you know foundation we can consider, because as far as at least I'm concerned, uh, we're not going to make the 2050 carbon neutral thing unless we do this kind of stuff. So, in that vein, uh, we did this before with the EITF with some of the stuff we proposed, and in fact, won an SBIR with some EITF uh, backing that Robert Sipes helped us with, and Duke Energy and such, and so. There's no commitments needed for this concept paper, but we would like to invite this uh, Blue Horizons project to be one of the early tests for testing this in a community setting. So this would be, for example, there would be funding 
And uh, of course, these are grants. The government pays people to do this stuff. And um, there'd be funding and you give this a check, like go over to West Asheville and pick you know, a bank and a grocery store and a music hall and some other surrounding business in the neighborhood and come up with a little thermal network. So for example, one of the things mentioned earlier was um, uh, whatever, it was networks, local networks. And everybody thinks, oh, we're thinking electric, we're thinking electric. But remember, half of Duke Energy's power to residential and commercial is for thermal. So there's this big opportunity in synergy, and we're talking to John and Duke also on this and trying to get another utility on board. So anyway, I just bring it all up, and I'd like to, it, there's some real future possibility here, some more of just sort of reflecting what this group has been working on for years in terms, terms of trying to lead and move, push the ball forward. And so at the very least, it's another opportunity if, if you're interested in just being included we only put it, it's only asking for like a one, two line thing of what different parties would do, no commitments, um, then uh, we would love to include you. It would be, I think, a very positive thing. And, um, and, and, and on that list, by the way, are others. Like for example, we have a team going at MIT that's gonna be included as well for doing this testing. So there's different scenarios of testing that we're going after and such. Anyway, the, the invite's out there and I'll drop uh, Sophie and uh, Keith, I guess, a, a note on that. Great. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you about it more and figure out how we can work together on it. And we're, it's exciting. Great. Great. Uh, what I was going to, was, what I was just going to input uh, right on top of what uh, Rick just said, geothermal should be uh, a good uh, combo with the solar uh, since they're going to be building such a large building for the basic heating and cooling uh, I, I think you, you really want to look at geothermal in combination with solar. I would just put that out there and you've got an expert group <laughs> that is available in Rick and company uh, to be able to input on that. Okay. Just to add to that, which you all might find interesting, um, actually this grant is about going sort of to the next stage where it's like we're talking about reducing the cost of the geothermal part dramatically because you're, you're putting in ba thermal batteries in basements. So, so you're doing another step forward in this whole technological movement toward maximally, maximally efficient, lowest cost possible thermal solutions for buildings. Great, thank you. And thought I heard another voice in there. Yeah, Brad? this is Sophie again. Yeah. Oh. Um, oh, sorry, Brad, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just have a couple things. One, in terms of the scale at which we need to move to get to the 2040, 2050, whatever our renewable opportunity is, I'd like to just give a second to Rick in that, or to Rick, what Rick just said, that we need to up our scale of ambition. Uh, we did, a, we had a great year for solar and wind in the United States last year. I'm thinking we were around 25 gigawatts um, and it was a record year of new uh, capacity additions. And yet when I look at um, the um, work of Mark Jacobson, uh, which, which is his detailed benchmark of 100% renewable energy requirements to get there by 2050. And when I look at some work that I've done uh, for some writings that I've done and, and am doing currently, um, we need to be consistently adding five or six times more renewable energy per year, every year between now and 2050, five or six times in order for us to meet that goal. So we are still not anywhere near on the pace we need to be with these solutions. And we do need to be thinking big um, with what we're doing here locally. So I'll just put that out in a second year statement, Rick. And also then I wanted to remind people on a much smaller level um, that we have, uh, uh, you know, we are continuing to develop our Energy Savers Network's sponsorship program. And one of the things that I would like to enlist this committee in doing is to either through your business organization, we're very happy to have the first time we mentioned this, uh, that the Sierra Club came on board as our inaugural sponsor. Um, but um, we'd like to have others consider being a sponsor if you've got a business organization or if you can help identify 
some business organizations that you would help introduce us to or nonprofits. I mean, it could be a church, it could be a local community organization. There are benefits to the sponsorship program. And I would just ask for this committee to engage this committee in identifying and helping me to get in front of some people in the community that we might engage them as being a sponsorship of a sponsor of Energy Savers Network. Um, and so that, that's it. Thanks, Brad. Sophie, you were, I heard your voice before Brad or at the same time as Brad. Yeah, Rick, can you just send your previous comment to Beatrice by email maybe? She had a hard time capturing everything in the notes. Um, and then regarding the geothermal on Pratt & Whitney, I thought we had determined that they've already broken ground and um, that geothermal, it's too late for geothermal. Is that, am I recalling that correctly? So, no. You can do. I don't, I don't. I don't. I don't. My answer would be I don't. I don't know. I mean, they're working on the. <clears throat> they're working on the site. I mean, the civil work is um, is being done, but um, there's no building under construction yet. Right. Okay. All right. Well, um, is there any other comment? Do want to thank Kieran and Dieter and Julie for showing up, even though they didn't say anything. <laughs> but uh, thank you for being here. Unless there are other comments, I can, we will adjourn the meeting 20 minutes early, though I'm not taking credit for that. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, and uh, we will continue to work towards our goals of a cleaner earth. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Keith. All right. Thanks, Keith. Thanks everybody. Stay safe, everybody. Bye.